Welcome to Lab 6, Inference for Numerical Data. So uh, this lab shows up as a, an HTML document in the assignment. If you haven't got that document open, you might want to have that open in a separate window while you were, you're watching this. Probably would help out. Before we get into that, though, we're going to go do a quick review of the t-distribution and why we're using the t-distribution in the first place. And then we'll get into the actual lab. So why did we take large samples? What was the whole purpose of trying to get a large sample? And in our case, a large sample basically is an n greater than 30. And we said, well, as long as we knew the observations were independent and the population distribution was not extremely skewed, you know, really uh, crazy outliers, etc., then a large sample would ensure for us that the sampling distribution and the mean is nearly normal and that the estimate of the standard error um, s divided by the square root of n would be reliable. In other words, it's a very good estimate of our standard error. That's because s is doing a great job of estimating the standard deviation for a large sample. Okay, so that was our purpose behind it. So real quick, the sampling distribution of the mean being nearly normal. Remember, that's coming from what we refer to as the central limit theorem. And basically what it's telling us is that if we um, take a distrib any distribution, doesn't matter what its original shape was, and we sample means from that, that the distribution of the means will be approximately normal and will have mean the same as the mean as the original distribution we were sampling from, and it'll have standard deviation or um, standard error given by sigma divided by the square root of n. Okay, where so in other words, this, this distribution will be centered at mu. And notice that we are estimating sigma divided by the square root of n by s over the square root of n. In other words, we're saying that those two are nearly equal. If you put a dot over the top of the equals, that means nearly equal. Okay, all right, well, let's move on here. So the normality condition, which states the sampling distribution will be nearly normal, holds true for any size sample as long as the population distribution is nearly normal. In other words, if the distribution I'm sampling from, in other words, where I got my x bar from, in other words, the data I added up and divided by n, if that, that distribution was normal to begin with, then the distribution of the x bars will also be normal for any size sample size. You can have a sample size of five and it'll work, okay? Well, that's, that's really nice to know that. It's a very, very helpful, but it's also very difficult when you have a sample of five to determine whether or not the distribution you were sampling from was normal or not. Yet it's going to turn out that that's going to be an important thing that we're going to want to know. So for um, checking out normality for small samples, an important consideration is going to be to think about the data. Where did the data come from? Would we expect this data to be normally distributed based upon um, what we know about it? Okay. And again, you still want to look at it, and particularly if you have a sample size like 10 or more, you still will want to look at your histogram and your QQ norm plot to verify whether or not you've got um, a, uh, an indeed a approximately normal distribution, okay? Okay, so the T distribution. So we're going to replace the standard normal N zero by one with a new distribution called the T distribution. And the reason we're going to do that is because the t-distribution works really well with small samples. It, part of our problem is, is even if we know the original distribution that we're sampling from was approximately normal, and thereby the central limit theorem tells us our sampling distribution of x bar will also be approximately normal, we're not getting nearly as good of an estimate of the standard deviation of the... Um, of the sampling distribution of x bar. In other words, we're not getting a really good estimate of the standard error. And so the uncertainty in that standard error is addressed or taken care of for us by the t distribution. So uh, a minute ago, we just said, well, look, we said that you know, in, in the case where n was greater than 30, we know that sigma divided by the square root of n is very well approximated by s divided by the square root of n. Well, now we're talking about small samples. So in other words, samples where n is, is less than 30. And now that standard error may not be as well estimated by s <coughs> divided by the square root of n, OK? <coughs> so to compensate for that, there was a famous statistician, William Gosset, who, who developed the t-distribution 
Uh, if you have some time, look him up. Go say who happened to be working at the Guinness Brewery at the time. They had a statistics department in the Guinness Brewery when he was developing this. So anyway, the distribution has a bell shape, but the tails are thicker than normal models. Therefore, observations are more likely to fall beyond two standard deviations from the mean than they would under the normal distribution. These extra thick tails are helpful resolving the problem with a less reliable estimate of the standard error since n is small. So if you take a look, the dashed one here is the normal and the uh, blue one, the non-dashed non one, is our t-distribution. Now, this normal that they're talking about right here, this is n of 0 by 1. This is the standard normal that they're referring to. And the, the t, what t does is it actually starts to approach the standard normal as you increase the sample size. It has a single parameter because it's going to be centered about zero every time, but and its standard deviation is going to vary based upon um, the, the sample size. So the larger the sample size is, the closer and closer t becomes normal. All right, a little more about that. Let's take a look at this slide to kind of give us an illustration of that. Notice that the dark one, the dark uh, black line is the normal distribution and that for different degrees of freedom we see t. So so as in the standard normal z it's, it's centered at zero. In other words this normal run right here this is the standard normal of zero by one and remember we say that that standard normal has got as its um, axis value is, is a z. These are all x's for the, the t's okay but the main thing here I want you to see is that the, the, the changes its shape based upon the um, degrees of freedom and what we see is as the degrees of freedom the df right as they approach basically to 30 then t approaches the standard normal in other words it becomes very much similar to the standard normal and so it's in a sense it's self-correcting in other words t basically becomes z as you um, allow n to get big. And the upshot of this is, is that in the real world, no one uses the z distribution um, anymore for hypothesis testing for means. Everybody uses the t distribution because it automatically takes care of that additional uncertainty for you. So when we go to actually run um, test of hypotheses for the means, it's, it's going to be much to our advantage to use the t distribution. So unlike what we did in chapter four, where we went and found p norm and q norm and used those to find our our values of the p value and our position on, on the axis, we're going to use uh, pt and qt. So more about that as we get into the lab, all right? Okay, so let's quickly review confidence intervals and see how that changes now as compared to chapter four. So confidence intervals, only a slight change. Notice that all confidence intervals are going to be given by some sort of a point estimate plus or minus the margin of error, where the margin of error is calculated by a product of a critical value and the standard error, or the SE being the standard error. Since small sample means follow a T distribution and not a Z distribution, the critical value now is going to be T star as opposed to Z star. So what we're going to have now is we're going to have X bar plus or minus T star times s divided by the square root of n. So notice that this this is really very much exactly the same thing that we're working in chapter four. The only difference being that what? We're replacing the t star where we used to have the z star. Okay, so let's let's uh, wrap this up here and then we'll get on to actually working on the lab. So recap, inference using small sample means. If n is less than 30, means that the, the distribution follows a t distribution and the standard error is going to be by s divided by the square root of n. And again, the conditions that we need is that independence of observations, often verified by a random sample, and if sampling without replacement, the sample size needs to be less than 10% of the population. n needs, if n is less than 30 and there is no extreme skew, um, this also works for n, also for n greater than 30. n can be greater than 30, n can be as big as you want, and this is going to work just fine. One of the things is that we're going to want to do is, is check when we're doing um, uh, sample, or inference with sample, small sample sizes, is we should also check someplace along the way the normality condition, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as we get into the problems. Okay, so we will now get into the actual 
lab here, which is in uh, R Studio. I'm going to open up my R Studio for you here. I've already opened up assignment 7.rmd, put it together, and I have got the HTML file open with our, our lab 6 inference for numerical data for us to take a look at. So to start off with, we're going to take a look at a consumer group is interested in testing a claim with a new SUV getting 17 miles per gallon overall. And so they get a copy of, or a, a rendition of this vehicle and they test it over 10 tanks and they get the following mileage. And so they want to know, do the data provide convincing evidence that the mileage is overstated or could be or could these low mileages be due to random variation? To decide this, we're going to use a hypothesis test for the mean known as the t-test. We'll use the calculations, we'll do the calculations manually at first and then we'll do it again asking R to perform the calculations. So our first got job is going to be to get this data into our studio. So part of the reason for having it as the HTML document is that if you just highlight that and copy it and then go back into our studio, you can open a chunk and you can paste that data directly in here without having to type it in. Okay, it's not a very big data set because we're working with small sample sizes, but nonetheless you can do that. So let's go ahead and run that chunk. And now notice over here in our environment we now have a variable called MPG. Okay, so that's our miles per gallon and we want to do a little bit of exploration of that data to decide about the normality condition. Uh, we have pr pretty well um, established that each of these miles per gallon are probably independent from each other. We're assuming that this vehicle is representative of all of the vehicles in the population. We could have got 10 different vehicles, but obviously that's relatively difficult to do for most consumer um, companies like Consumer Reports. Okay, so first thing they tell us to do is, hey, go take and make a histogram of this data. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's come back up into our chunk here. Should I should not exit out of my chunk right away. And let's put in a hist mpg there. So we're going to type in hist mpg because we've got that variable in there. And then let's go ahead and run that line. And we get the following histogram, okay? Well, what we notice in this histogram is it appears that we do have an outlier in our data set. It looks like there is a, an extreme value to the left. But that said, the rest of the data looks approximately bell-shaped normal. So this was probably a rare incidence. Uh, maybe uh, for some reason had all the windows rolled down while they were driving. Who knows? Something was going crazy there. Let's go ahead and take a look at the QQ norm plot also. So we take a look at the QQ norm of MPG. And if we run that, we can take a look at that line. Where you want to go down here. And again, we see the outlier down here, but we see the rest of the data follows a pretty strong linear pattern, all right? So what that tells us is that, um, you know, we have a suspected outlier in the data, but that said, I mean, it's up to us. We can decide whether to remove that outlier from the data set or we could keep it. It uh, probably belongs in there. It could be maybe that it was with the vehicle fully loaded or it was towing or something like that. Who knows? But um, there, if you need to discuss perhaps with the people who recorded that data point why that, that mileage was there and decide whether to keep it in the data set or not. But notice that if we come in and we actually calculate the Z value for that particular data point, if we come in and run the Z score on that and take a look at it, we see that it's got a z-score negative 2.2. So while it is an unusual data point, it's not extremely unusual. It's not like three standard deviations above or below the mean. So we would report that we had one outlier, but we can go ahead and soldier forth with the t-distribution from here, okay? All right, let's go ahead and get into actually doing the hypothesis test. So a um, couple of questions or exercises with the answers built into them that we need to go through first of all. And obviously, we're not going to type all this stuff up into our um, RMD. We will do exercise three together just to see how that works, all right? So first, we're going to state the hypotheses in English, and then we will state them symbolically. So the average mileage for these vehicles is, as claimed, 17 miles per gallon. The average mileage is different than is claimed. That is, it's different than 17 miles per gallon. If um, 
we wanted to do a one-tail test here, we could. I mean, we could say that mu was less than 17, but uh, the researchers perhaps here decided that they wanted to use a, um, a value of not equal to 17. From, well, so which, which, what is our decision rule here? Well, from consumer's perspective, a type two error would be more harmful. That is rejecting the alternative that the miles per gallon was not equal to 17 when in fact it was. Now, you know, one thing to remember about a type two error is that it's, we failed to reject the null hypothesis when it was false, right? In other words, what that says is, is we supported the null when it was false and we rejected the alternate when it was true. So if the miles per gallon is not equal to 17 and we reject it, that's worse for the um, consumers and not necessarily for the manufacturer of the vehicle. So we're going to go ahead and roll, since this is a consumer reports, possibly we'll roll with 10% for alpha, okay? That, I wanted to remind you of that, that that's sort of the analysis you want to do for making your decision rule. But very straightforward. If, whenever in doubt, if you have you know, really no reason to, um, to do that analysis, just set alpha to 5%. It's the gold standard. People will not argue with you. If you take a look at pretty much every statistical paper or any, every research paper that uses statistics in it, you'll see they usually almost always use alpha for 5%. All right. So all else fails. You don't know what to set it to. Set it to 5%. Okay, so we're going to go get some some information here. So let's go ahead. I'm going to actually type these in instead of copying these so I can talk to you through it, what we're doing here. So let's insert another chunk. And in this chunk, I want to go in and I want to say, you know, what is the mean? Well, that means I want to know what is the mean for the, for the MPG. And actually, I need to um, keep that stored or assign that. So I'm going to assign that to X bar. And X bar is going to be equal to the mean of MPG. I'm going to need that in, in when I actually do the calculation here. And then another thing I'm going to need is the standard error. So to get the standard error, we can do this in a, a two-step process. You can go find out what S is. I did that actually in the lab. I said, okay, the standard uh, sample standard deviation is given by S, and that N is the length. Or you could do that all in one command if you want. But um, I'm just to make it a little easier, I'm going to go bite sizes here, okay? So S is going to be equal to what? Well, that's the standard deviation of the MPG. And then a nice new command is going to be equal called length. And if you have a single vector, this works. It doesn't work for data frames. It works for just a single vector, which is what we have right now, is that it gives us the size of the, uh, the vector. In other words, how long the vector is. Now, our standard error, we know the standard error is going to be equal to what? Well, that's S divided by the square root of the sample size n. So like I said, we could have got SE all in one swell foop by just replacing SD MPG here and length MPG in the denominator, but I think it makes more sense typing it out this way. Okay, so now what that gives us, <clears throat> let's go over to the whiteboard here for just a second. What that's giving us is our way of calculating our test statistic. So if we go back to the whiteboard, let me get over to the right page here for you. There we go. And then let's go ahead and go to a blank page. What do we know? How do we calculate the test statistic? Well, um, let's recall real quick how we calculated a z-score. We said a z-score was equal to x minus mu divided by sigma. So what it did is it gave us the number of standard deviations the x value fell above or below the mean. Well, it's kissing cousin if we say that, that z came from the standard normal, in other words, from the normal distribution from 0, 1, then its kissing cousin is going to be t. And t is going to be equal to x bar minus mu over s divided by the square root of n. In other words, it's going to be given to you by your sample mean minus your population mean divided by your sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. All right. So if you recall back in the previous chapter, we did this exact, we used exactly the same formula. We said that that was X bar minus mu. And again, I'm going to put a little sub zero here. That's the mean of the null. In other words, it's the null hypothesis mean divided by S over the square root of N. So notice that the, the observed value of T is going to be calculated exactly the same way we did Z. So, so that's nice, nothing new. So <laughs> I'm kind of stoked about that. I don't know if you are, but we'll, uh, We'll see if you are in a minute here. Let's go back to our studio now. Come on, your computer, cooperate with me. 
No, I don't want Chrome. Sorry about that. Let me just second here. <clears throat> okay, so I want to calculate the um, the value of the T observed. So I'm going to put in a new name here. I'm going to call it T dot T dot obs. So T dot obs for T observed. And so T observed, what's that going to be equal to? Well, T observed is going to be our X bar, right? Minus the mean given in the null hypotheses. Well, the mean in the null hypotheses was 17 miles per gallon divided by our standard error, which is SE. All right, so why do we need that T observed? What is that going to do for us? Well, let's go ahead and run this chunk and then we'll get some, some help here. So by running the current chunk, one of the things that we're going to, I need to go echo back down here for us just so we can see it, is I'm going to be able to use that T observed to help me decide whether or not my data set was unusual. And in particular, it's going to give me my P value. So uh, let's go back to the whiteboard again for just a second. This time, hopefully I can get to it without kicking off Chrome. Okay, so like the, the Z distribution, if we want to go in and calculate a p-value, it's going to be the probability of finding that particular value or more extreme in the distribution of the null. Okay, well, um, the t-observed value that we just found was basically negative 4. Let's go back to RStudio for just a second here. Notice that that t-observed was negative 4.28, okay? So how do we actually calculate the p-value? What, what would I do to calculate the p-value here? Well, remember that the t-distribution is at 0. I'm, just to make life easy, we'll say that's negative 4.28 right there. But this value, whatever I calculate right here, whatever this um, shaded region turns out to be here, since I'm doing a two-sided test, I'm going to have to double that. In other words, I'm going to take whatever that is, whatever that p-value is, and I need to multiply it by 2. In other words, whatever that value is that comes out to be right there, I will double that because I'm going to need to have the corresponding area up here since I'm doing a two-tailed test. Hopefully at this point that's starting to make more sense to you, okay? All right, so how do we go about finding that? Well, notice that this is a t-distribution. Now, the t-distribution is completely determined by a single parameter. I need to know what its degrees of freedom are. And the degrees of freedom are always going to be given by n minus 1, where n is the size of our sample. So let's go back again for just a moment to our studio. <clears throat> and let's see, we, we know actually what the length is here. We can go ahead and get that. We know that the length whoops, is just given by n, wasn't it, right? So we had 10 observations. Well, that makes sense because we did 10 gallons of gas, right? So our T distribution that we're going to be working with is going to have degrees of freedom equal to 10 minus 1, which is equal to 9. So as with the normal distribution, when we were up here working with the normal distribution in R and we wanted to find the probabilities or proportions or areas under the normal curve, we used P norm. And so the nice thing about, is, about R is they stay consistent. They don't change their commands other than th that, um, the name of them. And what I mean by that is, is the P and the D and all that, they remain constant through all the different distributions. So in our case, what we want to do is find a probability. We want to find a PT because we're using a P distribution this time, not a normal distribution. And again, it's going to find the area from the left for us automatically. So we're going to go minus 4.28. That is our left-hand endpoint. And now we only need to give it one other piece of information, just the degrees of freedom. Unlike up here, when we were working with a normal distribution, we had to give it x, we had to give it mu, and we had to give it sigma. In the case of a t distribution, there's only one thing necessary. We just need to give the degrees of freedom. Okay, That's an F there, really. OK, so uh, let's go and put that into our chunk here. So let's go ahead and calculate the p-value. So to calculate the p-value, I'm going to go pt. And then I'm going to put in my t-observed. 
So T obs, notice I, I did myself a favor by storing it, so I don't have to type that number in. And then I put in my degrees of freedom. So one way you can put in your degrees of freedom is you can say df is equal to, and you can put in n minus 1, since n minus 1 and n is defined already. Okay, so let's go ahead and run that. And we end up with the degrees of freedom is equal to 0.00, excuse me, not degrees of freedom, our p-value is equal to 0 0.001. Well, not quite. What is why? Why not? Why is that not our our p-value. Well, because that's only the area for the one tail. So what do I need to do? I need to make sure I double that. So in other words, what that gave me was the area just on the left-hand tail. And if I double that, I'll also get the area in the right-hand tail because the t-distribution is symmetric. So our, our value for the p-value is 0 0.002 or 0.2%. So our chances of seeing the um, the x bar that was given, let's go ahead and take a look and see what that x bar was real quick. A sample mileage of 14.87 in the distribution of the null that was centered at 17 miles per gallon, or more extreme, is about 0.2% if the distribution was correct. So we're going to run with no, the distribution was not correct and that that's not true. Okay? All right. So, um, I'll let you finish reading up the rest of this, what your decision is and what your conclusion is in the rest of the exercises. I mostly want to show you how to do the, um, the R stuff at the present, okay? All right, let's do this again. This time though, uh, well, let me back up before I start this. I want to tell you that if you're given summary data, in other words, if the problem in the textbook that you're given gives you a sample mean, and the problem in the textbook gives you a sample size and it gives you a sample standard deviation. Then you would simply enter in those numbers over here. You'd put in what the sample mean was right here, what the sample standard deviation was right here, what the sample um, size is right here, and then the rest of these commands will remain the same. In other words, you can use uh, R very handily to do all of the calculations for you for your hypothesis test. And as we'll see in, in the second part of this, you can actually also do it for uh, creating confidence intervals, but manually. But if you're given the raw data, if you're not given the summary statistics, that that's where R was designed to work. R is not really designed to work with summary statistics. R is designed to work with data. And so it has a bunch of really nice built-in functions that assume you are working with raw data. So in exercises six and seven, no difference. What things change dramatically as we get down here to part eight. And if you notice in part eight, there is a single command called the t-test. And I really invite you, which we'll do it here in just a second, to go take a look at the question mark t-test, exactly what it, what it does. And uh, if you watch the course videos, there was a lot of help in the course videos explaining how to use this also. So t.test, mpg mu equals 17 alternative equals 2 dot sided confidence level equals 0.9 will produce for us a a, uh, a one sample t-test is what it's called because we're, only, we're dealing with a single mean or a single sample here with a two-sided test because it's a um, the alternative is a not equals and since we said we're working with a 10% uh, level of alpha then that means that the confidence level is going to be 90%. So the relationship between confidence level and alpha or level significance is, is that one plus, uh, excuse me, the confidence level plus alpha has got to add up to one, okay? That, that's a really nice, nice thing to know. Okay, so if I come in and I actually run this line, let's go ahead and just copy this line and put it in. And I put this into our studio which I'm in our studio. Let's go in here and put this in a chunk. I'm going to go ahead and open a, a new chunk just for this. And I come down here and I enter just this single line and I execute that line. Notice it gives me all sorts of amazing output. So it's one sample t-test because there was a single sample there. It gives me the t-test statistic, the same one that we had before. It gives me my degrees of freedom. It gives me, hey, look at that, the same p-value we got just a minute ago. Let's see. When we calculated that by hand, we're getting the same thing, aren't we, right? And it also gave us a 90% confidence interval for the mean. And, and it said that, hey, 17 is not in that interval. So again, that's a good reason to reject the null hypotheses. And then it gives us the value of the sample mean. 
all of that with no muss, no fuss. It's a much cleaner way of doing it. But again, one more time, it only works with data. You have to have the data. If you have summary statistics, if you're just given the summary statistics, then you're kind of stuck with the way we did it up here in part one. All right, um, let's, let's go back one more time. I want to show you down here in the console, I want you to do a question mark t.test. I want to quickly go over the, um, the things that the t.test does because we're going to be working with uh, paired data and independent data here in the coming problems. When you're working with paired data, you're going to do just a one sample t-test for the difference in the pairs. In other words, you're going to continue to do it exactly how we just did this. But when you're working with independent data, which is in this week's discussion question, then you need to enter in two data vectors, the data vector for the first sample and the data vector for the second sample. So that's what the x by y is, okay? So for example, if you're working with boys' weights and girls' weights, the first vector would be the boys' weights and the second vector would be the girls' weights. And again, the, the test will, will just basically take care of all the muss and fuss, no hassle at all. Okay, quick look at the uh, your turn and then or on your own and then we'll be out of here. This is getting rather long. Okay, so you need to make sure you cut and paste this set right here into your RMD, put that in directly. That's going to load the data norm temp. Norm temp is uh, a data set that was taken uh, from various students trying to decide whether or not the actual body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. There's an argument that all of our thermometers are set incorrectly and that um, 98.6 might be a little bigger than we want. Okay, So if you need any help with that, of course, please do not be shy about putting in questions to an instructor. And I'll meet you all back here for the next one.